Having reached the end of my poor sinner's life, my hair now white, I grow old as the world does, waiting to be lost in the bottomless pit of silence. It was a beautiful morning at the end of November. We set off toward the mountain as the sun first appeared. While we toiled up the steep path that wandered around the mountain, I saw the abbey. by the bark of what I later learned was the head of each. This was an octagonal construction that from a distance seemed a tetragon whose southern sides stood on the plateau of the abbey, while the northern ones seemed to grow from the steep side of the mountain a sheer drop to which they were bound. I might say that from below at certain points the cliffs seemed to extend reaching up toward the heavens with the rocks same colors and material which at a certain point became keep and tower. Three rows of windows proclaimed the triumph rhythm of its elevation, so that what was physically squared on the earth was spiritually triangular in the sky. As we came closer, we realized that the quadrangular form included at each of its corners a heptagonal tower, five sides of which were visible on the outside. Four of the eight sides, then, of the greater octagon, producing four minor heptagons, which from the outside appeared as pentagons. And thus anyone can see the admirable concord of so many holy numbers, each revealing a subtle spiritual significance. After the gate, which was the only opening in the outer walls, a tree-lined avenue led to the Abbasur church. To the left of the avenue there stretched a vast area of vegetable gardens, and as I later learned, the botanical garden. Around the two buildings of the Barniari and infirmary and herbarium, following the curve of the walls. Behind, to the left of the church, rose the edifice, separated from the church by a yard scattered with graves. The north door of the church faced the south tower of the edifice, which offered frontally its west tower to the arriving visitors' eyes. Then, to the left, the building joined the walls and seemed to plunge from its towers toward the abyss, over which the north tower seen obliquely projected. To the right of the church, there were some buildings sheltering in its lee, and others around the cloister. The dormitory, no doubt, the abbot's house, and the pilgrim's hospice, where we were heading. We reached it after crossing a handsome flower garden. On the right side, beyond the broad lawn, along the south walls and continuing eastward behind the church, a series of peasants' quarters, stables, mills, oil presses, granaries, and cellars, and what seemed to me to be the novice's house.
immediately realized that the edifice was much older than the buildings surrounding it. Perhaps it had originated for some other purposes, and the abbey's compound had been laid out around it at a later time, but in such a way that the orientation of the huge building should conform with that of the church, and the churches with its. The church was not majestic. It was firmly set on the earth. At the first level, it was surmounted like a fortress by a sequence of square battlements, and above this story another construction rose, not so much a tower as a solid second church, capped by a pitched roof and pierced by severe windows. A robust abbatial church such as our forefathers built in Provence and Languedoc far from the audacity and the excessive tracery characteristic of the modern style, which only more recent times has been enriched, I believe, about the choir, with a pinnacle boldly pointed toward the roof of the heavens. Two straight and unadorned columns stood on either side of the entrance, which opened at first sight like a single great arch, but from the columns began two embrasures that, surmounted by other multiple arches, led the gaze toward the doorway itself, crowned by a great tympanum, supported on the sides by two imposts, and in the center by a carved pillar, which divided the entrance into two apertures. In the tympanum, I saw a throne sitting in the sky, and a figure sitting on the throne. 